Hello everyone, welcome to another lecture for drug delivery principles in engineering. Uh, Let us talk about tissue engineering that as we have been discussing for the past few lectures. So, just a quick recap of what we learned in the last class. So, again as I said we are talking about tissue engineering in this particular module and uh, in the last class we basically focused on a paper um, which had actually uh, done uh, coatings of uh, ECM proteins. So, in this particular case this was fibronectin fragment. And uh, what we showed there is uh, you can use the protein adsorption to coat your uh, protein of interest and in this particular case what the author showed is if you coat a particular protein uh, which can bind to integrins uh, alpha 5 beta 1 this fibrinogen fragment this will essentially start signaling through this uh, alpha 5 beta 1 and will produce more bone on these surfaces. And then the authors further went ahead and used a rat model and showed that. Uh, on a rat model this leads to enhancement in the osseointegration. So, such coatings can be then useful for treating uh, osteoporotic patients if they get fracture because uh, a bigger problem uh, that they face is that once they are implanted with bone and bone screws over a period of few months uh, these screws started to become uh, loose and that causes a lot of pain and uh, they cannot put weight on it. So, they have to go back for resurgery. And at that point they have also lost more bone because the screw uh, needs to be drilled into the hole into the bone as well as the bone is resorbing around the plate and the screw. So, some of these strategies uh, can be used. So, this is just one of the ways uh, tissue engineering to support function can actually further enhance uh, the function uh, than um, when it was after the fracture. Okay. So, we will continue further on this discussion, uh, let us now focus I mean this course is obviously drug delivery. So, let us now focus more on drug delivery in tissue engineering and uh, what we are saying here is uh, essentially figuring out why is a drug delivery important in tissue engineering. So, uh, having now got some base in tissue engineering, we will uh, we'll move forward with this and say that it depends mostly on application and again this is something that you will find right throughout the course where uh, most of the things will depend on what application you are using it for and uh, but then uh, nearly all applications of engineering will require some sort of release of either chemicals or other biologics, drugs, even sometimes cells. So, all of that becomes important uh, in tissue engineering and that is why it is an integral part of a drug delivery course. And so, in the period in the today's class and uh, next couple of classes we will learn how and drug delivery is being used and how we can essentially modulate that to get better tissue response. So, just to give some examples before we go further in depth is uh, proteins such as VEGF uh, and PDGF these are required for blood vessel formation. So, let us say if I put an implant into the body and this plant this implant is fairly thick let us say this is in uh, 10 of centimeter. Then the tissues and the cells uh, inside will not survive because the oxygen, the glucose, as well as the waste transport is severely limited since there are no blood vessels, right? When I put this implant and let us say if there are cells in it, um, the, the cells have no way to survive unless they can get oxygen, they can get glucose, they can remove the waste from the surrounding. So, uh, what uh, what is the major problem is that there are no blood vessels and so what uh, people have done in the literature is to encapsulate uh, molecules such as VEGF and PDGF which are uh, growth factors and signals that causes the blood vessels to form. And so, what can happen is let us say if I implanted this and there was a blood vessel going near this it can induce uh, new vascularization new blood vessels to form and sort of penetrate this and essentially provide these nutrients to this uh, cells in these implants. So, uh, so that is important. Another example is to use antibiotics to prevent infections. So, again a uh, lot of the time it is being seen that if you have an implant um, it can it can get uh, infected since this is an external implant maybe at the time of surgery things were not pure. So, let us say if I an implant which uh, 
uh, which can which is susceptible to start having colonization of bacteria. So, what you can do to prevent that is uh, you can always uh, encapsulate few antibiotics and so this is sort of a prevention based method where you have encapsulated antibiotics in an anticipation that may be after the surgery the, there might be few bacteria around and this antibiotic does not need to release for a long duration maybe it is only going to release for let us say 3 days but that might be enough to kill off the surrounding bacteria and ensure that the implant does not get infected because again if the implant does get infected uh, then instead of helping the person uh, with uh, with any sort of comfort it is going to make the life worse where uh, lot of inflammation lot of pus formation and uh, the healing will not happen in fact uh, the tissue will get more damaged and the only solution then uh, most of the times becomes is to remove the implant completely. lot of the time you may be uh, putting in uh, as we talked about in the organ donation you may be putting in something that is foreign and if you do put in something that is foreign the, again the immune system is going to recognize it. Let us say if this is uh, these contain cells that are derived from pigs or some other human for that matter then my immune system my antibodies the T cells B cells they will recognize that as foreign and essentially we start to uh, attack this uh, implant and uh, of course uh, if they start doing that the implant cells will die and not only that again it will cause lot of inflammation causing lot of sickness to the patient and so what is again uh, done here is preemptively you will release molecules that are anti inflammatory or immunosuppressants. So uh, molecules like rapamycin are typically used for this or other drugs basically and these will come out these make sure that uh, this attack is blocked and so um, that way the implant can survive longer. And again um, you may want this uh, release of immunosuppressants to be over a period of quite a long duration I mean as long as these cells are here you may want uh, this immunosuppression to keep happening and uh, so that is why um, the drug delivery as well as the control release becomes important in this scenario. And then of course uh, as we discussed in few cases maybe sometimes you want the cells that are coming in to your implant to get signaling in a certain manner so that uh, let us say this implant is to uh, regenerate liver tissue let us say you are putting an implant that contains uh, uh, matrix essentially. and uh, what you want is the cells to actually come in this time and use this matrix to sort of build up the lost tissue but then uh, the cells alone may not be sufficient the cells may require certain signals and at that point you may want to release some growth factors from here let us say these growth factors causes the cells the, these are stem cells let us say and let us say these growth factors causes the stem cells to differentiate into liver cells. So, in that case what you will find is uh, these growth factors if you slowly release them and uh, ask uh, the surrounding stem cells to come in to the liver this will have a better therapy for your tissue engineering. So, again this is just few cases I am giving there are several several of them um, you can pretty much pick up any tissue engineering paper and you will find that there are uh, release of molecule that is happening throughout this process or uh, absorbing proteins or absorbing um, factors releasing drugs all of this is a is a continuous part of tissue engineering and uh, we will discuss some of these strategies as well as we go along and again it is not limited to these molecules it could be any other molecule uh, could be a painkiller could be something else uh, just depends on the application and what you are trying to cure. Okay, so, here is just a review paper uh, talking about using polymeric growth factor delivery strategies for tissue engineering. So, what are you seeing here is essentially uh, three different cases and in one case what you have what you have done is very similar example what I just gave previously you want cells to migrate in and if you do want cells to migrate in you are basically causing a gradient of uh, these black dots inside your scaffold which then will slowly come out and uh, these cells get attracted by these black dots let us say and so these cells will come in and uh, 
start to migrate into this implant because um, of these uh, gradient of these uh, molecules that you have encapsulated. Another example here is maybe you want to use stem cells and want them to differentiate. So, again there could be um, drugs that are encapsulated in a matrix that will cause these cells to come in and then differentiate into the type of cells you want. Maybe if it is for liver or whether it is for lung just again uh, depends on what is the organ that you are trying to treat and uh, that will cause uh, uh, better tissue engineering applications or this could be just to sort of increase the number of cells. So, maybe you are putting in cells uh, with uh, the implant itself, but uh, you want to increase the cell density. So, that more and more of them are there and the function is getting restored more and more. So, um, uh, that you can also do again using these proliferative agents or um, these small drugs that will help in proliferation of the cell. So, again here is a list of some of the growth factors that are commonly used uh, very widely used actually uh, growth factors in tissue engineering and uh, here are some of the major ones. Uh, one is uh, EGF epidermal growth factor again very widely used and uh, its major function is to cause proliferation of epithelial mesenchymal and fibroblast cells. So, in, in the previous case it was example C that we saw that you want these cells to proliferate and start uh, maybe due to some accident you may be lost 20 percent of your cells. So, in that case you may want to deliver EGF in a scaffold in that area. So, that not only the cells do migrate in, but you still have to make up for the 20 percent lost cells and so that way they can start to differentiate and proliferate. Then you we already talked about the PDGF the platelet derived growth factor and there are three types of them. And as I um, as I told you before that this is uh, to sort of uh, mature the blood vessels and so what you get is you get proliferation as well as chemo attraction of smooth muscle cells which are essentially these cells that surround the blood vessels and uh, that causes the maturation to happen. They also cause uh, ECM synthesis and deposition. So, if you are uh, uh, sort of wanting the cell environment to improve you want more ECM to be there uh, some of these growth factors are used. Another one is transforming growth factor alpha, so also known as TGF alpha and this is used for migration on proliferation of the cells again very similar to EGF and also extracellular matrix synthesis. Then there are several of them, uh, then there is TGF beta um, also act as chemo attractant. You have BMP one of the most uh, important proteins in a body and have several several applications in different types of cells. Um, they are called bone morphogenetic, but essentially um, um, they have applications on other cells as well, but essentially differentiation migration of the bone forming cells. Um, then you have other veg VEGF we talked about again very widely used uh, VEGF is nothing, but vascular endothelial growth factor and that will cause the uh, migration proliferation survival of endothelial cells, which are nothing but the cells that line up blood vessels. So, um, um, if you want the new vessels to grow in you want to have some VEGF in that area and that will attract these endothelial cells, they will cause the migration, they will proliferate as well as they will survive and form new blood vessels at those sites. Again, so you do not really have to remember the functions for the part of this course, uh, but it's still it is good to know because a uh, lot of these you will read in papers and a uh, lot of these will be maybe you will use in your own research. So, this is something uh, just for your information. Okay. So, uh, again uh, using a scaffolds you can primarily deliver three things uh, and again not only these three things you can deliver some other small molecules as well, but majorly you are looking at protein delivery. So, let us say if I am delivering some uh, um, some VEGF or some PDGF uh, to cause the blood vessels to form in these uh, scaffolds. So, um, then I can use protein delivery, I can release let us say VEGF, uh, it is going to go and signal on these endothelial cells that are lining the blood vessels and essentially it will cause sprouting of new blood vessels. So, uh, these cells will now get attracted and they want to move in this area. So, they will start forming a sprout that is now going into this and further proliferating as it goes and uh, that way you can have um, sort of good oxygen and glucose presence within the scaffold as well. The other thing you can do is you can uh, instead of delivering a protein you can deliver the DNA that codes for that protein and the DNA slowly releases out whatever cells are in the vicinity takes up this DNA 
and uh, then they produce the protein of interest. So, um, and then that way you can uh, have more sustained release because uh, the DNA is going to be a lot longer duration because once the cell gets transfected maybe it remains transfected with that DNA for a period of over days to months and that way you can have release over a period of months or the third example here is a cell delivery where essentially you can uh, just have cells encapsulated in them and these cells uh, may be are performing certain function maybe you if you are lacking insulin so you can produce insulin through this, these cells through uh, pancreatic beta cells um, or if let us say you are lacking a certain enzyme um, these cells are known to produce those enzymes you can encapsulate those cells and that way they remain in the site that you want these proteins to be present as well as uh, um, they are happy because they are in a matrix surrounded by them sometimes they want you want to protect them from immune system so they also for that you use matrix as well and we will discuss some of these cases uh, through this course as we go along. So, here are some more uh, sort of zoomed in images of a matrix. So, um, uh, let us talk about uh, non covalent affinity first for biomaterial matrices. Um, so, you have a biomaterial, um, this could be uh, this could have a natural affinity for growth factor. So, that means that the growth factors will itself go and interact with it. And if I make the biomaterial completely out of these chains, then what will happen is these growth factors are since they are interacting, they are binding to these chains with some affinity. And then they will slowly release in the media as uh, as the time goes on or as the material degrades itself. The other exam the other case you can take is you can use uh, um, a molecule called heparin. So, this is uh, essentially nothing but uh, derived from the literature where you will find that heparin has quite a lot of affinity for growth factors and it has several binding sites to these different kinds of growth factors. So, what you can do is you can uh, conjugate your heparin to your polymeric chains and what that will do is that will create an affinity for growth factors by itself. So, you do not really have to cross link the growth factor um, and uh, that way you can essentially ensure that uh, uh, these growth factors are there. So, uh, important point to note here is that uh, the um, ECM the natural ECM. So, if you take natural growth fact natural ECM they have all these binding sites for heparin and uh, your growth factors. So, those can uh, also be used, but uh, this is if you want a certain class of polymer for its particular property you can still modify them these polymers to be able to release these growth factors. And obviously, you can always directly conjugate it as well uh, it, um, there is no problem with that also. And then the other thing you can do is you can use uh, some of these ECM fragments themselves that I just said has natural affinity for these growth factors. You can conjugate the ECM fragment and then they will automatically start to bind your growth factors. So, that is one way to sort of uh, get your uh, things uh, delivered as well as uh, bound. What it ensures is that you are in none of these cases you are actually covalently binding a growth factor to your polymeric chain and that would ensure that your growth factors are not losing their activity because if you covalently link the molecule then those molecules will tend to um, sort of have lower activity compared to the non covalently linked. And then uh, there is other strategies is to use non covalent affinity for endogenous ECM. So, in this case uh, this is not a problem at all. So, you have a natural material called let us say here for example collagen and uh, what you can do is you can bind your growth factor with a collagen binding domain. So, this domain since it is collagen binding it is going to go bind to the collagen chains essentially linking growth factor to your chains. The other example is heparin sulfate. So, the same thing you can do is you can again have um, binding affinity conjugated to your growth factor uh, with the heparin and then uh, the heparin binding domain will go and bind to your heparin matrices. And again very similar to this you can make your uh, ECM or incorporate uh, other ECM components into your things and uh, you can again put your ECM binding domain in here. So, these things these non covalent affinity are actually very important because see what happens is let us say if a cell comes and the cell wants to take this growth factor up. So, let us say there is a large cell 
that is binding site for this growth factor. If these growth factors are covalently linked to your material, then the cells cannot really take them up, right? Because the cells will try to take them up, because but the your material is huge compared to the cell size. So, um, the cells are not able to take this. In this case, what you are doing is if the cell affinity is higher than this natural affinity or any of these affinities, then the cells can come, they can take up the growth factors at the rate that they want to take this up and that will ensure that the cells have lot more control which typically always leads to better healing. So, that is some of these advantages here for using non-covalent affinity. Obviously, you can always do the covalent affinity and bank on the polymer to degrade or maybe it is just a cell surface receptor, the cell does not need to internalize it. In those cases, those systems will also work, but typically what has been seen with the research is these systems work a lot better than the covalent binding ones. And again as, as we were just discussing, so you can have uh, covalent binding, so you can actually take a chemical moiety and cross link your growth factor or you can uh, uh, have it links as that there is a proteus cleavage site. So, what that does is even though it is covalently linked, there is a cleavage site which cells can cleave, the cells all have proteases both secreted as well as on their membranes. So, if you do that then uh, these will essentially uh, be cleaved and the cells can come and bind to this growth factor whenever they need to and take it up. So, um, here is a typical example of how this looks like. So, an extracellular physiological environment of growth factors. So, you can have growth factors uh, linked either to your chains or just encapsulated, the cells will come in, they will interact with your ECM as well as these growth factors and essentially um, that can help them perform or enhance their function um, in quite, quite a good manner. Here is another example of this, so, this is uh, a group uh, Jeffrey Hubble's group where they have developed uh, fibrin derivatives for control release of heparin binding growth factors. And so, what these uh, authors have done is they have made gels. So, these are essentially nothing but gels or you can also call them hydrogels since fibrin uh, derivatives are fairly hydrophilic. So, they have made these hydrogels and uh, in that what they have done, they have attached uh, some peptides. So, this is a bi domain peptide where one domain binds to your fibrin. and uh, another domain binds to let us say heparin. So, if it is a bi domain, one domain binds to this, one domain binds to the heparin um, and so this is your heparin. So, all you have to do is you have to make the hydrogel, um, this is uh, you have to link your uh, bi domain peptide. Then all you have to do is just incubate this with heparin and once you incubate this what will happen is first of all this bi domain peptide will go and bind to your hydrogel chains which are made out of fibrin and once you put the heparin there, uh, you can wash it in the middle if you want if you are putting this in excess. Uh, this heparin is going to go and bind to this bi domain peptide and then all you have to do is just put your growth factors and as I described in the previous slide that heparin is fairly promiscuous in binding lots and lots of different types of growth factors and those will automatically go and bind. So, essentially um, this G here represents the growth factor which binds to heparin and there are several of them. So, that way you can achieve, uh, so again this G is now available right, I mean if a cell comes and it wants to interact with this growth factor, um, all it has to do is just uh, have more affinity. Uh, compared to the heparin which typically most ligands do, most surface receptors on the cells do and so that way it will be able to take up this growth factor. So, here are some examples, so what you are seeing here uh, on this is a gel that is being formed and uh, on the x axis you have time which is in days and on the y axis you have how much of the growth factor in this case a growth factor which is used is NGF is being released and uh, essentially in fraction. So, 1 basically means all of the growth factor that was ever released. So, if you have unmodified fibrin which is not conjugated to your bi domain peptide, 
and uh, the heparin what you see is pretty much uh, within less than a day within less than a day almost all of it is released and uh, it whereas if you uh, put in a heparin containing matrices so essentially you use the bi domain and essentially bind it to the heparin and then put the growth factor in there you see uh, more continuous release and some of it is hasn't been released even at the end of two weeks but the cells can of course come in and uh, take whatever is remaining so such such systems will give you a lot more sustained effect uh, more and more cells will continue to move into your hydrogel uh, because they are continuously sensing this growth factor being released from it whereas uh, in this case the cells will move in for the for one day but once uh, that is over the cells have really no incentive to move in or to even stay there so um, that is uh, one example and then further uh, the authors went ahead and uh, showed that um, this is so these gels then they start using I mean NGF is a, a neural uh, growth factor so these cells then they used for uh, a neurite extension experiment where uh, if they only have fibrin um, as it is being shown here they get a certain extension which they have normalized to one but then uh, as uh, as you put these growth factors and uh, uh, use the system you see a lot more pronounced effect uh, you can start seeing uh, so solid bar is essentially no heparin so you see that uh, if you have no heparin and you are releasing the growth factors you do not really get much response as was fairly clear that these growth factors are getting released within a day or so but uh, if you do if you do put your heparin in there you see a lot more extension of these uh, neuronic cells just because uh, there is a sustained release of growth factor over time. So, essentially that is what is described here the concentration they used here was 20 nanogram um, but again uh, this is more a conceptual thing that if you have a continuous release uh, using some heparin or continuous actually retention of this uh, growth factor uh, the cells are liking it much more ok I think uh, we will stop uh, here and we will continue further in the next class uh, see you then thank you.